better? A little bit better, but let's go ahead and proceed with the presentation. <sighs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, I don't look as horrible as I look on the screen, but uh, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, as uh, got with me, uh, said, my name is Frank Otero. I've been in business for 31 years. Um, and what I want to do is share some of the uh, experiences that I've had in terms of uh, business development. Um, with me is Mike Tolliver, who's a senior vice president in charge of our uh, business development and um, uh, marketing area. And he'll be sharing some perspectives uh, regarding the proposal prep area. Um, I think you went over the um, housekeeping items, so I'll just jump. Uh, considering that we only have a short period of time, approximately about 20 minutes, I tried to identify um, four key areas that I would like to stress. Uh, I think that these four key areas address uh, anyone, if you've been in business for a year or many years, um, these have been some of the keys that I have learned and practice in terms of uh, operating my business. Uh, the first is that uh, business relationships. Uh, our industry is very, very dependent on business relationships. Uh, the old adage goes, you know, you like to work with people you like. So um, developing a business relationship with prospective uh, prime partners is key to uh, the success of you developing your business. Uh, another area is in terms of market intelligence. Um, you need to come prepared with information as to why you're going to, uh, what are you offering uh, to a prospective prime? Uh, or if you're uh, going after it yourself, um, no understanding and learning as much as you can is vital uh, thing for you to do as part of your uh, strategic process. A question that I always uh, am constantly asking myself is, wh why why should they select my firm? Okay, I think that you need to ask yourself this question. Be brutally honest with yourself, and this is a way of testing yourself to make sure that what you're uh, how what you're offering is unique. Okay, um, uh, whether it's the people that you have, the relationships you have with a particular uh, agency. Uh, whatever the case may be in your, but you need to ask yourself that question. And lastly, um, uh, and this applies, I think more to firms that have been in business for at least five years or longer, uh, is looking at developing strategic relationships. Um, after you've been in the field for a while, you've worked with a number of firms, then what you try to do is understand which are the firms that have the best synergy to work with you. Um, so those will be the four areas that I'm going to be addressing. Now, uh, in terms of business relationship, uh, as I said, it's all about relationships. Uh, it, once you develop a relationship with someone, the key is to manage that relationship. It's a lot easier to maintain a relationship than develop a new one. Uh, so you need to invest in that relationship. Um, and you do that in many different ways um, uh, in terms of staying in contact with the person, uh, being social with the person, if that's something that you can do, you know, have an occasional lunch um, uh, once we're through with this COVID issue, of course. Uh, but um, Try to uh, look to see, you know, the same way you have personal relationships, you have to have business relationships. Uh, you want to get along, you know, the, that is what is going to be a key to success in, uh, in building those relationships. You should also um, identify and target the um, companies that you want to uh, work with, okay? Um, you just don't want to shotgun yourself. You want to know why you want to work with a particular firm. Is it that they're in a 
very specific sector that you're interested in? Uh, is Are they aligned with your type of organization and the services that you provide? Are they a firm that has a uh, corporate commitment to uh, diversity and inclusion? Uh, understand why you're wanting to do business with that firm, okay? Uh, also, before you meet with a uh, scheduled meeting uh, to introduce yourself and your company, prepare yourself. You know, um, know as much as you can about the company. Um, uh, and that information is readily available just by going to their website and doing a little research with an ENR or some other um, information sources. But be prepared. Know something about the, the client. Uh, know uh, a little bit of history, the, uh, what services they're aligned in, what their reputation, what their ranking and e and R. Uh, just be prepared so you'll have something to talk about. You know, uh, another key to biz developing business relationships I have found is networking. Um, our industry has a number of organizations. Um, you should identify those that are best aligned with you. Uh, none of them are free, so there is an investment in time and money, but you want to be uh, participating in these because these networking functions, one of the key things is that you'll be able to meet with many different uh, prospective uh, clients. Um, a networking function allows you that opportunity to meet with uh, multiple different uh, people in a social setting. Uh, another way of developing that uh, rela business relationship is be active uh, participant in industry organizations. All the organizations have committees and subcommittees. Become, identify those that you're interested in. You'll be at the table talking with these people. You'll further develop your relationship with them. It'll be an opportunity to learn and develop uh, uh, more information about uh, your uh, business relationships with individuals. They'll see that you're more actively involved and it'll be a way to really bridge that relationship. And finally, um, you know, whatever you promise, you have to deliver. There's no way quicker for you to lose all that investment in developing a business relationship than promise something that you can't de deliver. So don't ever over deliver uh, promise. Uh, it's a lesson. Uh, as entrepreneurs, our tendency is to want to do everything that, that we're asked. And you also got to learn to say when you can't. And because it's better in the long run, it'll be uh, much more uh, beneficial to you to be honest with that client if you cannot deliver, okay? Uh, market intelligence. Um, yeah, again, you want to identify which agencies do you want to uh, work with? What are the geographical areas that you want to work with, okay? Um, so you need to do your own in, uh, homework and uh, to understand where you want to be uh, positioned. Uh, once you've identified the agencies and the geographical locations that you're interested in, let's say we're in the New York uh, tri-state area, so we have New York, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, uh, all neighboring uh, states, um, then review their capital program. Um, that'll give you an insight as to A, do they have money? and how they're planning on spending it, okay? Uh, because you don't wanna be focusing on agencies that don't have any money, for it, okay? Um, you want to look at the uh, website. There's a, a tons of information in there. It'll give you information as to what procurements they have coming up. They'll have information as to what procurements they have already have awarded. You can see which firms have which contracts been awarded to them. You can also see which pro uh, contracts are expiring. So you could start positioning yourself with talking to maybe the incumbent in terms of identifying uh, an opportunity that you would like to be joining their team. I also strongly suggest that you meet with the Office of Civil Rights. 
they're there to help you. Um, and but you have to avail yourself and uh, understand what the corporate culture is. Is there a 20% minority participation? Is there 30%? Um, uh, what is the basic philosophy of that agency in terms of minority participation? Do they have set aside programs? Do they have um, any special um, training programs? You, you need to invest to understand how you can partner and take full advantage of that agency being a partner of yours and helping you develop your business. Uh, you need to identify any procurement opportunities that are up, up and coming. Uh, that's what you wanna to talk to your primes about, okay, your teaming partners. And finally is know what you have to offer, okay? Um, just, you know, there are gonna be 30 other small businesses that are gonna be knocking on that Prime's door. What is it different about you and what you have to offer to, to the Prime? Because he can't put all, he or she cannot put all 30 um, minority firms on the team. So how are you gonna separate yourself from the pack? What do you have to offer? So these are key questions you need to ask yourself constantly in order to understand how you're going to strategize and uh, uh, pursue that opportunity and that prime. Uh, and going to this question, uh, why select my firm? Uh, if you can't answer that question, I would suggest you don't have that meeting until you are able to. Uh, because you should be clear when you get to that meeting, whether it's a phone call or in-person meeting, what is it that you're going to tell him or her as to why you should be selected, okay? Um, is it relevant experience that you have? Is it qualified staff or uh, people that have worked at that agency before know the agency or people that uh, you have that are known to the agency. What is it that you have to offer? Is it some intelligence about that procurement that you have that it would be vital and a differentiator advantage to that particular um, prime? Um, also, make sure you have your all your certifications in place. You know. Um, because if uh, uh, most agencies have minority participation goal, I know that the certification process is onerous and uh, something you got to be re re uh, updating annually. Uh, but it's part of doing business. So just have someone uh, dedicated to that responsibility. Um, we're certified in about uh, 30 different locations throughout the US. Uh, it's just an effort, but it's a re in order to be successful and do business, you have to have that certification in place. Uh, you don't want to start the certification process once you have been invited to be a part of a team. In all likelihood, you will not have your certification in time for the submission of that uh, proposal. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I'll talk about strategic relationships. Um, you, after you've been in business for a while, you have created a, um, a profile, a, a, a resume of projects that you have worked on. You'll have also uh, learned which relationships, which primes are good, uh, which ones are not so good. Not all relationships are very good. And there could be instances where the prime doesn't pay you on a timely basis or doesn't uh, uh, stick to his commitment in terms of the uh, minority participation uh, scope of work that you had originally agreed to. So you got to learn how to start weeding this out. But I know as a um, early stage firm, the tendency is you want to work uh, on every opportunity. But at some point, you need to get focused, okay? And part of the focusing is looking at how you want to start developing and building relationships with certain primes that you have been had a successful, uh, profitable working relationship with. 
Uh, and once you identify that list, a subset of firms that you really want to focus on developing a strategic relationship is work it at one project at a time. What you want to do is prove yourself consistently that you can deliver and perform uh, as agreed to and as necessary. That is how they're going to see that you're for real. You're not just a one project type of situation. What you want to do is build on each successful project that you've worked on and leverage that relationship from that experience to expand to more project opportunities. Remember these primes, uh, they're all over the place uh, in terms of pursuing work and all kinds of work. So once you develop that successful relationship with them, then they can be bringing you on, on as a teammate on multiple project opportunities. So always put, ensure that you're consistent in the performance. Um, go out, visit your people. Don't just send them out to the project and uh, only thing you get from them is their time, uh, time sheet every couple of weeks. No, go out, visit the project, visit your staff, visit the client, talk to them, make sure that the, everything is going well. You don't want to get a call to find out that there's a problem. You know, you want to prevent that. So, uh, you, and if there is an issue, you want to try to resolve it before it becomes a problem. Uh, and I've, you know, a hard lesson is knowing when to say no. There are times that you, they'll ask you for something that you really are not capable of or can't deliver. So there's nothing wrong with saying no. And I, actually, they'll appreciate it. But you need to have that discipline to know that. And then ultimately, where you want to take your uh, relationships is to start, you know, uh, looking at JVs or partnering and association as you develop uh, more strategic relationships, you know. Um, on the flip side, that also creates situations where you're going more on an exclusive basis with them. So there's a trade off where when you play the field, you can be on five different teams. When you have strategic relationships in place, then uh, you may only be able to partner with one firm. So you need to look at each opportunity and see which is the best situation for you. But eventually you want to strive for that. Uh, and that's when you're going to get uh, a, a, a seat at the table. And that's ultimately where you want to be so that you're part of the decision making and you have an opportunity to uh, have a, a, a significant role on a project to develop your capacity because that's what it's all about. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Okay, well, um, thank you, Frank, um, and good afternoon. Uh, I think afternoon for everybody that's on the call. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to um, present my portion, which is writing winning proposals. Um, it dovetails perfectly into what Frank said, uh, uh, because um, in order to, to have a successful proposal, you really have to do all of those things that Frank talked about um, uh, if you really hope to be successful. Um, but I'm going to focus on, on the part that um, is the proposal writing piece. And, um, and I, I thought that I should point out that Paco um, is primarily a construction and uh, program management company. But for all of those firms that are um, on the webinar that provide other services, um, what I'm going to talk about really applies to all of all of you. It applies to, to, to everyone, no matter what it is exactly that you're trying to, to, um, to sell. So um, there's some things that you need to, to keep in mind um, when you are um, setting out to write a proposal. Um, and the first thing that you need to think about is what you need to do before you receive the RFP. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, doing your legwork, um, doing some of the things that Frank talked about, uh, your due diligence, um, and making sure that you're as prepared as possible in advance to um, once that RFP is released. Um, 
and then you know what to do after you receive the RFP, um, making sure that your ducks are in a row, and um, and also keeping in mind that putting together a proposal always takes longer than what you think. Um, we're we're going to talk about how, how to dissect a, an RFP document, um, understand you know understanding the RFP and what you're being asked to provide, both in terms of of the services that are required, but also the information that, that it's required in the proposal document itself. And then um, finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the tips to preparing a winning proposal. Um, and, and what that means really is tips that will really set you apart from your competition. So uh, Frank, next slide. One second. Sure. Okay. So um, I like to use the quote uh, by ben Benjamin Franklin that uh, uh, says that he said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And so it just underscores the importance of planning ahead before that RFP is released. Um, you want to, because you don't want to be surprised. Um, and you also want to try to be more um, proactive than reactive. Um, you also want to find out as much as you can about everything. Find out uh, as much as you can about, uh, about the client. Um, find out um, as much as you can about your competition. Um, some contracts, um, when you propose, you will have um, companies that already have the contract. And um, this is a, a renewal of the contract and it gives, gives you the option to, um, to knock one of them out. And so what you have to do is you have to make sure that not only you understand your client and, and your competition, but you need to understand, you know, who, who might have this contract and perhaps what their um, weaknesses are. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you understand your client's hot buttons. Um, all of the things that are important to them, um, things that, um, that you know that they'll be looking for in the proposal. And a lot of that stuff is hidden in the RFP document, um, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, and then finally, you wanna make sure that if you have to put together a team, uh, so if you're the prime and you have MWBE goals, don't wait till the last minute to select your partners. Um, make those phone calls early. And make sure that you pick um, uh, partners that bring strength to, to your team, uh, that um, also have a, a, a good reputation, and, and, get, and get a commitment from them that they will be on your team. Um, and we do that typically here just through, um, through emails um, so that we, every, we all kind of have an understanding um, that we're all together and we're committed. Um, your teaming partners play a, a, a strong role in, um, in your proposal and you'll often have to ask them for materials and you wanna make sure that um, you pick partners that you know will, will be there to support you on your, uh, through your proposal effort and that they uh, will bring value to your uh, proposal. Um, next slide. Um, so after the RFP is released, you finally have that RFP. Um, the first thing that uh, you want to make sure that you do is you get to get your ducks in a row. Um, you need to uh, review that RFP document. And we're, I have a sample RFP document that we're going to look at in a minute. Um, and, and you have to look through everything that they're asking for. Look at the scope of services that they're requiring. And then ask yourself, you, you can either do it formally or informally, if this is something that you should invest your marketing dollars in to pursue. Um, 
sometimes uh, um, we want to propose on on um, uh, jobs that uh, we think that we just might get lucky, and uh, you know maybe they won't submit that many, maybe people won't submit that many proposals and we'll get lucky, but um, that typically isn't a very good strategy, and um, you really have to be sure that you want to pursue the work, and you and you also want to make sure that you're able to go all in on the effort. Um, one thing that you'll um, see a lot of people do that prepare uh, proposals on a regular basis, like me, I've been doing it for more than 25 years, is um, you want to make sure that you prepare a checklist of the proposal requirements and, and the evaluation criteria and use that as a guideline when you prepare your proposal. So um, there will be, uh, in, a, in the RFP, there will be all uh, sorts of things that they're asking for. And you need to make sure that you don't leave anything out of that list. And the best way to do it is to do a checklist. Some, you, know, you could even use the RFP itself and put a check after it. But um, sometimes, uh, with, um, with some projects, some jobs, uh, they receive many, many, many amounts of uh, pro uh, proposals. And the first thing they want to do is to make sure that your proposal is compliant with what they've asked for. So if you've, you know, given them A, B, and C, and you've skipped over D because either it's going to take too long or, or perhaps you really don't have what they're asking for, um, or perhaps you've just um, you've just missed it by mistake, and that happens a lot because a lot goes into a proposal. Make sure that you have that checklist as a guide for the uh, for each proposal that you do. Um, and I, I covered this just in the last slide, but after the RFP is out, and if you haven't solidified your team, you need to do that right away because. Um, depending on the client, depending on the project and a number of factors, you could find that um, some of the firms that you think would make your team the strongest have actually committed to another team and they can't commit to your team. And then you find yourself looking for firms that either you may not have worked uh, with before or don't know very well, um, or maybe don't have the same reputation as the firm that you were hoping to um, include in your proposal. So it's really, really important that you think of that in, in advance of the RFP, but if for some reason you haven't, or if you've, you didn't know the RFP uh, was going to come out and you just kind of, kind of fell into your lap, make sure that's something that you do right away. Um, we lost the presentation. Um, Sorry. There we <laughs> and um, uh, you're going to, you also want to make sure that if there are any sort of um, project or if you're selling something else other than a professional service, um, anything else, anything that's related to the, what you're trying to sell, make sure that you, re, uh, you review all of that documentation and the documentation could be drawings. It could, all, it could be photos, it could be a pricing list, it could be a number of different things. But when you're putting together a proposal, you have to have all, you have to know all of the information um, to put together that, that proposal and to make sure that it's good. Uh, so anything that you have to review that's related to what you're pursuing, make sure that you take a look at it. And then finally, um, make sure that you have the resources available to produce a good proposal. Um, if, if, if you receive an RFP, you didn't know about it in advance, and, um, and then you know the, the date is in two weeks and you've it's sat on your desk and you haven't really decided, and it's a, it's a week before the proposal, is due and you have limited marketing resources, you might really want to rethink whether or not you should, uh, you should pursue that, that project. 
Um, and the key is really just to be as prepared as possible so that you can make sure that the re your resources are available um, to produce that, uh, th that proposal, um, you know, so that you're not scrambling up until the very, very last minute to get it out the door. Um, next slide. Uh, no, uh, next slide. Okay. So one thing that, um, that I, I, I do occasionally, depending on the um, uh, pursuit and, um, and also, uh, you, know, um, what, you know, whether it's something big or small or depending on the time factor, is I, I do a go, no, go assessment. And it can be a formalized process or it can be something informal. And we sometimes do it formally here at PACO. Um, but the important part is to really um, honestly ask yourself whether um, or not um, it's something that you should pursue. And so um, here I have some, um, it's a typical go, no go uh, assessment form. And with some of the questions and the first part of the form, you'll see that um, it asks, um, it, there are seven questions and which, which really the answer really needs to be yes to all of them for the project to move forward. Is it funded and likely to move forward? Well, you know, that, that's an important thing to know. Um, do you have the required expertise? Do you have the right people? Does the client think that, we ha that you have the right uh, expertise? Um, have you done this kind of work before? Um, are, do we think that we're going to be able to demonstrate this expertise to the client? So, uh, for instance, if um, they say your experience has to be in the last five years, do you really have that to show? Um, will the project be profitable uh, and very important? Do we have the time to prepare the um, proposal and presentation? And, you know, is there something that uh, we, um, is there something that, that could be out there that could stop us from winning? Um, for instance, is somebody on the um, selection committee that um, that they that don't that, that they might not like you, or you've had a, a bad experience with, or something uh, like that? You know, just make sure that you you know everything in advance, and 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 then finally, do you have strong candidates with the experience needed to win? And you need to be able to answer yes to all of those questions. And then if you are able to, uh, to answer yes, then you can go on to the next page. And I don't want to run out of time, so I want to move through this quickly. But here's some other questions that you can ask, and then you can score yourself. And uh, I won't go through all of them, but you'll see at the bottom there, I, had, um, I showed a score of 39. And if you read at the bottom, if the score is less than 40, the pursuit has to be approved by senior management. Sometimes you're not right at the number you need to be, and 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 this judge uh, and this form is somewhat subjective, so it it'll warrant a discussion um, with your management as to whether it makes sense to pursue it. And you may want to pursue for um, strategic reasons, and that's fine because if you haven't proposed for a client before. Sometimes you have to be pre prepared to lose a couple before you win, and that's okay. But you really want to make sure that you do an honest assessment of, of um, the RFP. Uh, Frank, next slide. This um, this is a this is a, a an RFP document that um, I purposely picked a, a short one, and I'll. And I'm only going to um, go through a couple of these just for time reasons. But this shows you in, in an RFP the requirements, what they're looking for, and what you must include. Um, so all of those are important. And remember, these, this he, here is your checklist. 
So whether or not you create a formal checklist or you get to, you're putting together your proposal and you get to A, which is a detailed description of how the consultant proposes to perform its services under this agreement. Once you feel that you have this in your proposal, you can check that off. But when you look at each of these things that are in the RFP, you need to make sure that you also answer them better than your competition. And you don't answer them just to answer the question. So uh, I'll pick out another one to, to move uh, down the list a little bit. Um, but let's do an, uh, well, this one's important. So uh, an estimate of person hours by task, discipline, and by month. Um, I, I just saw that one and I wanted to point that out. Um, so not only is the writing in your proposal very, very important, but also the, the costing in your proposal is very important. So um, I, it, at my firm, I typically take care of all of the writing part and then the financial piece, I'll, I'll, I might draft it up, but then it's reviewed by someone else. But you have to make sure that you are very um, not only accurate in the costing of whatever you're selling, but you also have to, uh, you have to make sure that in the end, when you perform these services, that it's going to be profitable for you. So it's, it's very, very important. Um, uh, moving along just kind of all the way to the RF, uh, to the end of the RFP. And this is really where the important part is. Um, it's the selection criteria. This is how they're going to judge you um, when you put together your RFP. So here, demonstrated understanding of the work scope requirements, including but not limited to the quality and completeness of any required submissions. So you have to take each one of these selection criteria and understand that they have a score sheet uh, on, on the other side and they are evaluating your proposal against many, many other proposals. So the, here there are um, five, um, five criteria and you have to um, make sure that the way that you answer these is equal to or better to your comp than your competition. Um, the project approach and process methodology. Uh, when you're writing an approach or a methodology, you wanna make sure that it's not your boilerplate approach and methodology. You want to make sure that what you do is customized and that it's also turned back around to the client. And this part's very important because it's a common mistake that people make. Um, you have to make sure that what you don't do is what, what they say is the wee wee show. And what that means is you talk about what you do and what you can do and what you've done before, and that's all great. But you then have to turn that around and uh, to where it's um, everything that I've done is of a benefit to the client. How is this going to benefit them? So you have to be careful. It's not all building yourself up. You have to use that experience to, to show that how it's going to benefit the client in your, in your proposal. Um, past experience on similar projects. So this again applies to and to anyone your where and and how long ago and how all of those things uh, of your private previous experience is very very important. Your client wants to make sure that you've been there and done that um, and that you are uh, capable and at the end of the day because they're responsible for responsible for making sure their project is a, su a success. They want to make sure that you are going to help them get to that point. Um, so it's very, very important that you convey that you've you, that you've you have this and you also have the um, people that are going to be able to do this as well. Um, and then the last point on here is is the cost part, which um, I mentioned, uh, some, uh, some things are cost competitive, um, but whether it's quality, uh, quality based selection or a cost based selection, 
um, no matter what it is, they, um, your client is going to expect you to be competitive. So uh, think, understand very clearly what the scope of work is and the level of effort and put together your cost proposal and then sharpen your pencil and then review it again and sharpen your pencil and um, make sure that you're very comfortable with what you're submitting to the client. Um, Frank, next slide. So um, just to wrap up here, um, I have uh, eight musts for writing a successful proposal. And um, the first thing is that you wanna do or that I do on all my proposals is to prepare a, a powerful yet you know, brief cover letter. Think of it as an executive summary. Sometimes these proposals for, especially for transportation agencies can be very, very thick. They require a lot of information. There are a lot of forms. And if you have a large team, it's, very, it's a lot of information. So try to encapsulate that in, in, in the beginning through your cover letter or an executive summary um, and make sure that it captures everything, all of this, uh, the strong points of your proposal. And um, in, in your cover letter and then throughout your proposal, focus on what you can do best for the client. What is it that you can do best than your competition? And maybe you can't do everything best than, the, than your competition, but maybe you have a really strong person that you know is better than anybody that they're going to propose. Bring it out in your proposal. Make sure that your proposal is accurate and every detail you pay attention to. Um, don't let your... Um, it's, it's okay sometimes for us to embellish a little bit in our proposals, but don't let your claims outdistance your true capabilities. And what that really means is don't oversell yourself. Um, it, it's good to, 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 to be strong and to, to, um, uh, and to push your, your services and your people, but make sure that you don't put something in your proposal that you really can't back up. Um, be cost competitive. Uh, for me, it's always been important, but it makes a difference. The appearance, appearance of your proposal matters. So if it looks sloppy and unprofessional, that's the way it's going to be perceived by your client. So take the time to spell check. That seems easy, but you know, some I see typos all the time in proposals. Um, put some graphics in your proposal make sure that it's laid out well and make sure that it reads well. If you're the writer of your proposal, let somebody else read your work, somebody that's not connected um, to the proposal. Um, try to finish early. Uh, we always run out of time too, uh, you know, too soon when, the, when a proposal is due it and you're up against the clock. Try to finish early, finish a day early. And then finally I have on here, use red teams. and. If you don't know what um, a red team is, a red team is really a formal review process. And depending on the size of your project and what your firm does and what you're selling, you may want to do a red team. And, um, and this is, you, uh, you'll take your proposal and you basically, once it's prepared early, you'll take that proposal and you'll, you'll rip it apart from the graphics on the cover all the way to the last page. Um, and it's best to do this with some people that aren't so connected to the proposal, but understand the scope of work and have read the RFP. Um, and then of course, it makes your proposal way, uh, way better than, than what it would be if, um, if you hadn't done that review. So um, we're coming up against the clock. So I'm, I'm gonna end it there. And I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time, so we'll try as will the presentation be made available. And I just want to double check with Michael and Frank that you're okay with sharing the presentation. Yeah, what? absolutely. Okay, so we will share the presentation. What you'll do, what we'll do is send out an email to all of the attendees with the presentation, as well as a link to the recording. So the first question is from Mohammed Amre. How do we find out what projects are in the pipeline prior to the release? Uh, I'll start. Uh, there are two things. Um, most agencies have a capital program and they identify the projects um, that are in the capital program. Uh, and they usually will identify these projects over 
a minimum of five year horizon. So that's one source. Another is through industry um, contacts um, where discussions are very early prior to uh, projects even being formally um, approved. Uh, so uh, that's another way that you'll hear about it. And you know, read a lot about the, uh, through the uh, industry trade uh, um, information like ENR. And that gives you a pretty good perspective about what's being thought about in terms of projects um, uh, on a national level. Mike, do you have any? No, I think that covers it. Yeah. Okay. So our next question is from Andrew Yurchuk. Um, Mr. Tolliver, is there a secret to getting information on upcoming RFPs or current contract holder performance? Well, um, you know, Frank also uh, touched on this and um, one is to review capital programs and, and, uh, and if, if you're working with transportation agencies and we're Compto, of course, um, most transportation agencies have their capital plans uh, online and they include um, everything that they're selling. So it's not just, um, you know, construction or design, um, but it's everything that they are going to procure is typically in the, um, in the capital program. The, uh, the other thing that we do here, and I've done my entire career, is there are subscription services. For instance, we use um, GovWin, but there are many of them out there. And uh, they will send RFPs to your inbox, but you can also get advanced notice of RFPs that are coming. So they'll learn of a project somehow uh, that they either from a capital program or from, uh, from others, uh, some other source, and it comes to my inbox on a daily basis and I go through those leads. So sometimes it's searching the capital plan. If you have this subscription service, that's great too. And sometimes it's just searching for websites, uh, or through websites, and, and sometimes it's simply networking. Uh, I, I'd like to add two, two, two items to that. One is uh, most of the agency's website will tell you the contracts that have been awarded. So you'll see the dates of the term of the contract and that's good intelligence because it'll tell you when that contract expires and you can assume that's when it's gonna be put out to rebid. Uh, so that's something that you should be um, paying attention to. Uh, and the websites, uh, just about all the agency's websites um, track all their procurement activities. Uh, but a, a thing that I'd like to forewarn you about is if you've waited till the RFP to start trying to team, it's too late. <laughs> uh, so try never, you know, I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but normally if the, by the time the RFP is on the street, the primes have already teamed up. Okay, so um, don't waste a lot of time on that. And again, go back to what I talked about in terms of intelligence. Intelligence is key. All right, thank you. We have about two minutes left and unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, I know we had some delays earlier and I'd like to apologize for that. So what I'm gonna suggest is if you have any additional questions, what you can do is reach out to info, info at comto.com. Org, and we will forward those questions as we can there. Um, and before we go, I'd like to thank Frank and Michael for their presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for um, your patience as we dealt with some of these issues. And also, um, before we go, this is being uh, presented to you by our hub subcommittee. So I'd like to thank all the hub members who are hub subcommittee members who are in attendance and thank him for their work on the subcommittee. And once again, this presentation will be made available. I'll be sending out an email with the presentation and the recording to all attendees. And with that, we will um, have to end right now. Um, so once again, thank you everyone and have a good afternoon. And that's info, I-N-F-O at compto.org. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank all you right. everyone.